Amen. Thank you, Pastor Wesley. What a joy it is again to be with you this evening and to open the Word of God together. And appreciate so much you coming out this Wednesday night and continuing to support uh, the meetings. That's an encouragement to me for sure, and I hope it's an encouragement for you, one for another. Well, if you have your Bible with you tonight, and I hope you do, we are in Ezekiel chapter 43. Ezekiel chapter 43, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13 of this chapter, Ezekiel chapter 43, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. And again, there are many cubits that are mentioned, but don't get too caught up with that, because I want you to focus tonight uh, on the place of the altar. And I want you to realize that there is going to be an altar of sacrifice in the coming millennial kingdom. And if you still have your little plan with you, you'll see that altar is marked with the letter X on your plan. But let's begin reading in verse 13 of this text. And it says, And these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and a hand breadth. Even the bottom shall be the, a cubit, the breadth a cubit, the border thereof by the edge thereof round about shall be a span. And this shall be the higher place of the altar. And from the bottom upon the ground, even to the lower settle shall be two cubits and the breadth one cubit. And from the lesser settle, even to the greater settle shall be four cubits and the breadth one cubit. And so the altar shall be four cubits. And from the altar and upward shall be four horns, and the altar shall be twelve cubits long, twelve broad square in the four squares thereof. And the settle shall be fourteen cubits long, and fourteen broad in the four squares thereof. And the border about it shall be half a cubit, and the bottom thereof shall be a cubit about. And I want you to notice this line in particular, and his stairs shall look toward the east. Shall we pray? Father, again, we just thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercies upon us. Now, Father, as we open your word, help us to give attention to it as it is in truth, the very words of God. And Lord, we just pray that we would know your help in this hour and bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we've been looking these last few nights at the coming millennial temple prophesied by Ezekiel, and we've seen that this prophecy must require a future fulfillment, that there's no room for allegorization, that this is not a depiction of past, temp past temples because the dimensions don't fit and other criteria do not fit, neither is it a temple that is set for eternity, as some suggest because there is no temple in eternity. So we know this structure must be fixed in time if it doesn't belong to the past and it doesn't belong to eternity and we don't have it today, then it must be something that is yet future. And so we anticipate that when the Lord Jesus comes and sets his feet down upon the Mount of Olives and makes his way into Jerusalem and onto the Temple Mount, he will set the soles of his feet in the holy place and claim that spot for himself and from there this temple shall be constructed. Now there are many similarities between this temple and some of the temples of the past, but also there are some major differences between this temple and the temples of the past. For example, there is no Ark of the Covenant in this temple, no table of the law within it, no mercy seat, no veal, no golden candlestick, no table of showbread. But there is here this familiar sight of an altar of sacrifice. And whilst some similarities to that which went before are there, there's also some very clear differences between this altar and the altars that preceded it. Now that right there tells us something. It suggests that the millennial system of sacrifice described by the prophet Ezekiel differs in some way from the previous system so that it is not a simple matter of a straight reinstitution of Old Testament Judaism. Yet we can't get away from the fact that the temple of, of the future has this altar. In fact, in the nine chapters of Ezekiel that speak about the temple to come, eight of them make reference to the sacrificial system in some form or another. Now, such is the importance of this altar within the fabric of this temple and within its function 
that actually there were eight, there are eight whole days given to the dedication and consecration of it ceremonially. Let's look at verse 17 where we uh, left off. It says, uh, and the, uh, sorry, verse 18, and he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, these are the ordinance of the altar in the day when thou sh they shall make it, to offer burnt offerings thereon, and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests the Levites that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me, to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock of a sin offering. And thou shalt take of the blood thereof, and put it on the four horns of it, and on the four corners of the settle, and upon the border round about, thus shalt thou cleanse and purge it. Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering, and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house, without the sanctuary. And on the second day thou shalt offer a kid of the goats without blemish for a sin offering, and they shall cleanse the altar as they did cleanse it with the bullock. When thou hast made an end of cleansing it, thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish, and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priest shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them up for a burnt sacrifice, a burnt offering unto the Lord. Seven days shalt thou prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it. And they shall consecrate themselves. And when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day and so forward, the priests shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord God. So on day one, as this altar is erected, they bring forth the bullock of the sin offering. Its blood is placed upon the four horns of the altar, the corners of the ledge, the rim round about the altar, and then they burn the bull in the appointed place of the temple. On day two, the altar is cleansed in exactly the same way as before, but also now with a kid of goats for a sin offering, a young bullock for a burnt offering with salt and around for a burnt offering with salt. And so that continues right up until the seventh day. They do that every day from day two to day seven. And then on day eight, the priests finally offer the people's burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, and the Lord will accept them. Now, for the evangelical Christian, this scripture raises a huge question. Since we believe that the offering of Christ was once and for all, doesn't this altar with its sacrifices raise a specter of blasphemy? If we accept the possibility of some future sacrificial system being reinitiated, isn't it a repudiation of Christ's death upon Calvary? If we are to say that at some future time, as we're saying, there will be a temple in Jerusalem with an altar, with ordinances, with rituals, with priests, and with sacrifices, are we not in danger of undermining the very finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that is the matter at the heart of our study this evening. And before we do anything else, I want to consider the altar itself and look at some of the differences between the old altars and the new. Now, in Ezekiel's prophecy, the altar takes on a whole new aspect with two physical differences between it and its predecessors. If you look where I highlighted at the end of verse 17, the very last line says of this altar, and his stairs shall look toward the east. Notice those two things. The altar has stairs or steps leading up to it, and this altar is approached from the east. Now, these details have caused many in Judaism to question the veracity of Ezekiel as a prophet of the Jews. Why? Because first of all, in the, in the altars of old, they were prohibited from having steps coming up to the altar. Exodus 20 and 26 explicitly says, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not covered thereon. 
Secondly, by tradition, the priests of the, uh, of the Old Testament time would approach the previous altars from the south, not from the east. Now, why were steps prohibited in the previous temples? Well, the answer is a simple one. The high places had steps. The pagan high places had steps which led up to them. And so there was to be no, no likeness. There was to be no similarity between the altars of Israel and the altars of the pagans. And you'll appreciate that ancient altars were stepped uh, in, in cigarettes and, and other such structures whereby they raised up their altars. And then beyond that, those, their worship was... Uh, often the pagan worship often involved nudity and promiscuous rites. So to avoid any association with any of that, the Lord made the Jewish priests in the first place to wear undergarments and prohibited the Jews from building stepped altars whereby they could be exposed in their person. And so they would go up their altar by means of a ramp. Now, of course, in the millennium, all of this becomes unnecessary. Because Israel becomes, for the first time in its history, the Holy Land. Now, that might surprise you. You may have gone on a tour to Israel, and you've maybe heard it was referred to as a tour to the Holy Land. But you know, the Bible only refers to Israel once as the Holy Land. Holy Land. Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 12, and that in the context of the Millennial Kingdom. In fact, Israel today is anything but a Holy Land. It is a secular society, much like our own. And indeed, Tel Aviv is a hotbed of immorality. Uh, and the Israel, Israeli government are strong promoters of homosexuality and so on. So it's very far from a Holy Land today. But it will be a Holy Land when the Lord Jesus gets here. And there will be no form of paganism permitted. And Christ shall rule over a kingdom of righteousness. So this law that previously was to set apart the Jews from their pagan neighbors is no longer necessitated. It's repealed. It becomes redundant. Now as to the direction of the altar and the stairs, this too is a matter of separation. Because ancient Canaanites... And others worship the sun. The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. And that's how their altars were aligned. Pagans aligned their altars along an east-west line. And they worshiped the sun as it went through its motions throughout the day. And so to avoid that, the Jews of old caused their altar to sit on a north-south axis. The exact opposite of the pagans. But again, in the millennial kingdom, there will be no sun worshippers. Christ's throne is located in the western end of the temple uh, building. And so an approach from the east towards the west will make perfect sense. A far greater problem, however, concerns those passages that speak of sacrifice. Those that speak of this altar as a place of burnt offering and peace offering and sin offering throughout the millennial age. And it's not just Ezekiel that makes these claims, but actually there are four other prophets who make similar claims. Look with me, if you will, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 56 and verse 7. Isaiah and the 56th chapter and the 7th verse. This is what Isaiah writes, even as he contemplates their being taken into captivity. He speaks about the latter days. He speaks about the end of time. And he says this, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Remember, the Lord Jesus said the temple was to be a house of prayer for all peoples, for all nations. And their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Look also in Jeremiah, if you would, in chapter 33. Jeremiah and the 33rd chapter now, and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 33, 
verse 16. And we read, in those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me, notice, to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. If you turn to the penultimate book of the Old Testament, to the book of Zechariah, and to its very last chapter, chapter 14, and you come with me to the 16th verse, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 16, it speaks here about the Feast of Tabernacles, and that in the context of the Millennial Kingdom. And it says in verse 16 of Zechariah 14, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that those who will not come up out of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King the Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and come not, they have no rain. And there shall, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots of the Lord's house shall be like the bowls, notice, before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea, Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe or boil therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And then finally, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2. Notice what Malachi says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. So if it is true that the Jewish people struggle with Ezekiel's words, it is also true that many Christians bring into doubt not only Ezekiel's prophecy, but the words of Isaiah, the words of Jeremiah, the words of Zechariah, and the words of Malachi. You have to discount these tracts of Scripture if you're going to say that there is going to be no future sacrificial system in the coming millennial age. But, before we get ourselves into any trouble this evening, let's say this and establish this fact, that the sacrifice of Christ was once for all. Hebrews chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 present us with this glorious truth that Christ's offering for sin takes away our sin once and forever. And having been put to death on the cross, there is no more offering for sin. He was offered up once and for all. Hebrews then teaches us that the Old Testament sacrifices were mere shadows and types of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. And since Christ's sacrifice was final and forever, the practice of animal sacrifice is now redundant. Therefore, we assume there must be no resumption of the Old Testament sacrificial system 
without repudiating and blaspheming the finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. But wait a minute. Is that actually so? You see, just because animal sacrifices and priests have no place in the practice of this church age, does that mean they will have no place nor practice in Israel during the kingdom age? You see, throughout Scripture, there is a distinction made between God's program for Israel and God's program for the church. And so here's the really critical question when we consider this matter. Does the old, or did the Old Testament sacrifices save? There's the question we should be asking. Did the Old Testament sacrifices save? That's the pivotal question when it comes to addressing this particular thorny issue. And the fact of the matter is that people in the Old Testament era were saved by grace through faith in much the same way that you and I are saved in this present dispensation. In fact, Paul makes that very point in the book of Romans, chapter 4, when he says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to, pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were off to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, listen, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then if you think, well, Abraham lived before the law, he takes us to one who lives after the law and during the law, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are, are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Think about this. What did the Lord Jesus say when he was explaining the new birth Unto Nicodemus. Remember his question, and it's a rhetorical question. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Now, if Jesus was introducing regeneration, if he was reintroducing a new teaching, uh, then somehow, you know, Nicodemus could have been forgiven for his ignorance. He could have said, I've never heard of anything like this before. This is a new thing. But Jesus is saying, I expect you as a master of Israel, as a teacher in Israel, to actually know something about spiritual birth. I expect you to know that a man needs to be regenerated if he's going to make it into the kingdom of God. You see, God had been bringing regeneration to repentant sinners from time immemorial. And so salvation never came by means of animal sacrifice. The Bible teaches that. And, and, and it's in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. If you care to look there very quickly, Hebrews chapter 10. And, and we'll just glance at a few verses in this particular chapter, which really is summarizing much of what's going on before. It says in verse 4, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. In verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. In verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sins, thou, sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein. Notice, which are offered by the law. In verse 11, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now, did Old Testament saints understand that? I think that they did. In the book of Psalms, in chapter 40, and if you care to look at verse 6 of that chapter, Psalms chapter 40, and verse 6, the Psalm of David, we read these words, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. And likewise in the book of Micah, 
Micah also tells us that our salvation or the salvation of those to whom he was writing hinged upon the mercies of God and not upon the letter of the law. Look with me in the book of Micah, if you would. Micah and chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through to verse 8. Notice what the prophet writes. Micah chapter 6 and verse 6. Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What is he saying in that statement? He's saying, evidently nothing is good enough. Even if I give my firstborn son, is that sufficient? In verse 8 answers the question, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love, notice, mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, or with thy God. So to the objection that the renewal of the animal, animal sacrifices is unthinkable and would deny the complete efficacy of our Lord's atoning death, the reply is very simple indeed. No animal sacrifice in the past ever fully atoned for sin. Only faith in the Lord and his word brought salvation, and this has been God's way from the very first. It's a serious mistake, therefore, to insist that these new sacrifices will be a means of grace, a mechanism for securing salvation. They didn't achieve that in the Mosaic economy, and they won't do that in the millennial age either. That countless animals died in the Old Testament did not remove, did not move man one step closer to atonement. Now, we need to be very careful when we use the word atonement in understanding what that word means. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27, we read this. The tenth day of the seventh month shall be a day of atonement. And you and I often speak about the day of atonement, but the Hebrew phrase, if you care to check it out, is Yom Kippur Im. That is a plural term in the Hebrew, and it indicates not just a day of atonement, but a day of atonements. Now, this is important because we take that phrase and we understand that word atonement to relate only to the shedding of Christ's blood and the covering of our sins once and for all. And certainly that is entailed in the sacrifice of Christ. But there is more to the meaning of the word atonement than the covering of our sins. You see, atonement doesn't just mean to cover, it means also to cleanse. And it cleanses people, or even things, that they might approach into the service and presence of the Lord. Look with me in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, where the focus of Moses' attention now is on the mechanics of the Day of Atonement or Day of Atonements. And notice the, the 33rd verse, it says, And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priest's and for all the people of the congregation. Now, notice it's not just people, but things that are atoned for, things that are cleansed. It speaks here of the sanctuary of itself, itself of, the, of the tabernacle, of the altar. Now, here's my question. If atonement speaks always and only of a covering of sin or for sin, when and how can an altar or the tabernacle, which is but a tent, sin? Obviously, it cannot. It's an inanimate object. But they can be cleansed. 
And they were cleansed. And that cleansing allowed those people and those things to be placed into the service of the Lord and meet for his use. For anything animate or inanimate to enter into God's presence, it had to be ceremonially cleansed. And that's what in part the Day of Atonement relates to. Look at verse 30 of this same chapter. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So the Day of Atonement was a day in which men were allowed to approach unto God, but it was also a day in which objects were cleansed and unable to be used in the service of the Lord, and so that they could be set before him as part of that temple or tabernacle service. By the way, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if the offerings of Judaism constitute a threat to the truth of Christ's finished work, why were Jewish believers still engaging in them, zealous of the law? And why did Paul pay for other believers to make an offering? Look in Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Now, bearing in mind that we're long after Calvary at this point. Bear in mind that the church has already been birthed at this point. And we come to Acts chapter 21. And you come down to verse 20. And here we read, And when they heard it, when they heard of the Gentiles who had been saved through Paul's ministry, they, the saints at Jerusalem, glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, now notice this, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now did Paul stop them there and say, well, wait a minute, we're free from the law, happy condition, Jesus bled and there is remission, and you need to tell those Jews to stop their sacrificing and their festivals and put away all those things that they owned in the Old Testament. Does Paul say that? Well, let's see what happens. Verse 21, And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs, after the law. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this when we say it to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them, a Nazarite vow. Them take and purify yourself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walked orderly and keepest the law. And as touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing. You see, there was a distinction made between the practices of the Jew and the practice of the Gentile believer. The Gentile believer was freed from the law for sure. In Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, it was clear that he was not subject to those ceremonies nor to circumcision. But the Jews still had a loyalty to the law of old. And Paul had no qualms about not only paying for these men to, to fulfill their vow, but even engaging in it with them. And that would include making sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. So why then the need of the sacrificial or of the sacrifices? in the millennial kingdom? Well, I want to give you a few suggestions as we close out this evening. Number one, they may serve as a memorial. As has been recognized in the Old Testament, sacrifices were a type, a forward-looking memorial to the eventual sacrifice of the Lamb of God. During the millennial age, they, uh, they served as, they serve as perhaps as having a backward uh, memorial, looking back at the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifices offered during the reign of Christ will be no doubt 
visual reminders of his gracious work on the cross and the awfulness of man's sin that caused the shedding of his blood. But are they just a memorial? Is that all they are? Just a memorial? Nothing else, nothing, you know, nothing more, nothing less. Just the same as our Lord's table. Well, let me stop you there. The Lord's table is just that. It's a table. It is not an altar. In some churches, they refer to the communion table as an altar. In Roman Catholicism, in Lutheranism, and in High Church Anglicanism, you have reference to the altar. And that's because they believe in the doctrines of transubstantiation or consubstantiation, whereby they perceive that Christ is being physically offered upon the altar. And we certainly repudiate that notion. We don't have an altar. We have a table. And we remember the Lord around that table. Yet in the kingdom age, there is an altar. A place associated with sacrifice and with death. Not just a table. So tempting as it is to leave the matter there. And for me to say to you simply, well, it's just like the Lord's table. It just serves as a memorial. Thank you very much. Good night. God bless you. Hold it, hold it, hold it. There's got to be more to this than that. And that is not an entirely satisfying explanation of the reason for the altar. So here's another issue that I think concerns this altar, and it is this. Sin remains. Now hear me out. Sin remains. Although the conditions from the, for the millennial kingdom reign are far superior to this present age. You know, we will have a, a just rule. We'll have a regenerated environment. There'll be harmony between, the, uh, between men and the animal kingdom. Uh, the problem of sin and death, nevertheless, remains. In uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet highlights that very truth. He says this in Isaiah 65, 20, there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. He's speaking now about the kingdom. And he says, for the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. Now notice what he places in the kingdom age period. He places sin in there. He speaks about the sinner. And he, speaks, he places death in there. You say, well, how come there's going to be sin and death during the millennial reign of Christ? Because not everyone who enters into the kingdom will arrive in their glorified bodies. Some people will come out of tribulation redeemed but not glorified, and enter the kingdom age in their mortal frame. They will then have children during the kingdom age, and their children will be born in sin, just as our children are born in sin. And some of them, perhaps even as some of our children, will reject the Lord. In fact, Zechariah even speaks of the heathen being there. Now remember, the Lord has to rule with a rod of iron. This would hardly be necessary if everybody in the kingdom period was godly and everybody was, was glorified and everybody was living according to the book. So sin remains. Keep that in mind. And then I want you to remember that Christ is physically present. You see, prior to the incarnation, God's presence upon earth was manifest by the Shekinah glory that descended upon the, uh, the Holy of Holies or into the Holy of Holies in the time of Solomon. And approach unto him was made uh, by means of this priesthood and by an elaborate temple liturgy. You had to go through all this ceremony to make an approach unto the Lord in the Holy of Holies. At the first coming of Christ... God's presence was manifest in the incarnation of Jesus. He was handled directly. That's what John says in his opening line of 1 John and, and, and chapter 1. He says, we handle the word of life. We touched him. We were able to get that close to him. We, Peter says, we heard him. We saw him. And so they had this physical proximity to Christ that you and I in this church age do not experience. 
after the ascension of Christ, with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, believers were baptized with the Spirit, and God's presence now dwells within the spiritual temple, the church, a temple that is made without hands. And during the millennial kingdom, well, we'll see what happens. But the pattern is this, friends. It changes in the manifestation of the divine presence, the Shekinah glory, the incarnation, spirit baptism, are attended by changes in the way that men approach onto that presence. So during the millennial kingdom, Christ's presence will be manifest in a glorified physical way. Jesus will be physically reigning from Jerusalem as both king and priest. So when the divine presence resides in a physical, glorified form within the millennial temple, a new priestly liturgy, similar to the old but not exactly the same, will be instituted, which includes a system of sacrifice that allows men to come into the presence of the Lord. Now you say, well, what would be the purpose of that? Well, these sacrifices provide atonement. Time prohibits us, but Ezekiel says over and over again that the purposes of these sacrifices are to bring reconciliation. And as we've seen already, God's presence will be on earth in a new way that differs from the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament, the incarnation life of the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit indwelling the church as the spiritual temple. And this altar underscores that fact. It says you're in a whole new set of circumstances. You're in a new spiritual environment now. And so interestingly, Ezekiel, and I love this, it's only Ezekiel, uses a unique term to describe the altar of the Lord. In, in uh, chapter 43 and verse 15, he says, So the altar shall be four cubits, and from the altar and upwards shall be four horns. And you see the word altar there. In the Hebrew, it's the word Ariel. And the word Ariel simply translated means lion of God. Now I want you to picture this in your head. Here is the Lord Jesus, and he's sitting with his back, as it were, to the western wall of the, of the temple. The bifolding doors that were, would take the place of the old veil are wide open. So are the doors in the porch that leads into the holy place. And just beyond that is the altar. And here comes the priest now. He's not now moving north, south, south, north. He's moving from the east. And he begins to step up the steps. And as he comes to the top of the altar, he looks down the corridor at the Lord Jesus. And there he sees the Lion of God. And he lays a sacrifice before him. You see, when he steps up that altar, he's looking at Jesus now not as the Lamb of God that takes away our sin but as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the altar is no longer portraying a lamb. It is portraying a lion. Christ has come, and he has come now not merely to appear as our Savior, but he comes to sit upon this throne in righteousness as King of kings and Lord of lords. He has come to exercise equity and judgment throughout the entire millennial age. Well, how can a man possibly approach Christ in, in this condition? How can he possibly make his approach unto him? Here's the answer. He must sanctify or cleanse himself. Now, you've got to remember, Jesus is the government. The government is upon his shoulder. He's the one who bears the key to the house of David upon his person. And so in any society, no matter where you live, you always have to deal or you will inevitably have to deal with the government. You and I deal with the government all the time, whether it's the DVLA for our cars or the tax office or the passport office or the court system. We come into contact with government. 
And here we are in the millennial age, and men are going to have to come into contact with government. They're going to have to come into contact with the Lord Jesus. And atoning cleansing, remember, was necessary in Leviticus because of the descent of God's glory into the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40. A holy God had taken up his personal residence with a sinful and unclean people. Similarly, Ezekiel foresees the return of the glory of the Lord from the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley through the threshold into the Holy of Holies and he sees the same tension between a holy God and unclean people. Remember, there are mortals there in their physical sinful condition. And animal sacrifices are necessary during the kingdom age, because the glorious presence of the Lord will once again be dwelling on earth in the midst of sinful and unclean people.